With six novels and several awards in tow, we are joined here tonight by the New York Times bestselling author, Lisa Brackman. Lisa, welcome to the show. Hi, it's really nice to be here. So I just had the honor and pleasure of reading Black Swan Rising, which was absolutely wonderful. Um, I just did a review of it, which is now on my YouTube channel. And some of the things that happened in this story just absolutely blew my mind away. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to speak to you about it. So would you like to tell us and our viewers here a little bit more about Black Swan Rising? Black Swan Rising um, is a cheerful little book uh, that I actually <laughs> started in July 2014. Um, which I only say because of all of the, you know, the, the ripped from the headlines stuff that, that the book generally gets tagged with. Um, I sort of wrote it before some of the headlines, but uh, it's, it's about um, misogyny, mass shooting, and online harassment in the context of a highly polarized political campaign. Um, there are no Russians and there is no global pandemic in it though. But they're all that's missing, I feel like, out of this. <laughs> the uh, yeah, you know, it, was, it would have been making a little full, I think. <laughs> I think people would have been knocking on your door if you had included those back when you first published this. Be like, what are you talking about? And what is yeah, this? Yeah, probably like in dark suits. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, what was so incredible about Black Swan was that you know, it was really clear that there were a lot of things that could happen. And in mm -hmm. my um, review, I talk about how, as I read it, I was constantly asking myself, oh my gosh, what if this did happen? What if, what if, what if? And, you know, I started did a little bit of research to see, you know, how much of this has happened. And one of the biggest questions or one of the biggest topics in the book is about cyberbullying and cyber, her cyber harassment. Mm -hmm. And um, were there any real life events that inspired you to think about some of these issues? Well, it was mainly Gamergate. Um, and mm -hmm. that feels like it's in the distant past at this point, but it wasn't really all that long ago. And if you're not familiar with it, Gamergate supposedly was about uh, uh, fighting for integrity in journalism around games, but what it actually was, was an organized campaign of harassment and, as you say, cyberbullying, um, primarily against women and also people of color who were advocating for more inclusive games, you know, games that weren't just all high, you know, large-breasted women out to here in, you know, coin bikinis. And, and wanted to see themselves represented in games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reason, the Gamergate guys took this as a personal threat that somebody was coming to play in their playground. And, you know, the, 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 the women and people of color who were asking for more inclusive games weren't um, saying you can't have your games with the large-breasted women in coin bikinis. Um, but they, they were just, you know, asking to be included. And this was just seen as very threatening by these, by these young men. And um, the harassment extended beyond uh, just bullying online, which people tended to not take seriously at the time. It was just like, oh, if you can't handle this, you just shouldn't be, you know, just get off Twitter, you know. And a lot of women that have been, um, you know, in, in, in various, any kind of fields having to do with uh, computers and tech have experienced this kind of thing online. But it, it, it would, it would extend to death threats. Um, it would extend to doxing, like we know where you live, you know, you bitch, you know, we're going to kill you. Um, there, were, there were swatting incidents, which is when you, you call in a fake SWAT call um, and, and say that there's something horrible going on in the house and, you know, and then the SWAT team shows up at the door of your target. And, and that can be very scary and very dangerous. And in fact, I think that it actually did lead to a death at, at one point. That wasn't connected with Gamergate, but it was something else. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of it. Um, and, and then the other component, um, the mass shooting part, um, this was before the term incel was really popularized. The only time that you would even see it being used was in these forums by people who were self-identifying as, as incels. And um, I started reading about the link between that and mass shooting. 
So the famous one is Elliot Rogers. He was uh, in, in, in Santa Barbara and he left this um, uh, videotaped manifesto um, talking about, you know, uh, he deserves all the women and why doesn't he get all the women and he's going to kill all the women and all the men who to have the women. And this guy was seen as a hero, you know, by, by these, uh, the, these folks and in these forums. And you look a little bit further and there were so many mass shootings that had this tie-in to a hatred of women and a resentment of women. And what ended up happening um, was that the right, the, the white nationalist movement realized that there was a substantial overlap. They could go into these incel forums and find all of these alienated and angry and frustrated young men. And they say, hey man, we know how you feel. You know, these bitches don't place. Yes, you, you should have this. You are entitled to this. Let us, we'll tell you about the rest of the truth. And, you know, so, so what, what was happening and you could kind of see this, this thing gathering was this online, online harassment, um, especially women and people of color, um, misogyny that the, the, that was taken one step further into actual mass shootings. And you look at any mass shooter, almost every single one of them has domestic violence in the background or has expressed hatred of women in some form or another. And I think there's a lot more awareness about this now, but when I was first working on the book, you just didn't hear about it. And I'm like, why isn't this being discussed? You know, there was a guy that shot up the community college in, in, in Oregon. And, you know, you looked at his, you know, he was like incel, hey normies, if you go to school, you know, in Oregon, don't, you know, not don't don't go to school tomorrow because there's going to be a thing that's going to happen mm -hmm. and um and uh, you know this guy went on about how you know why was he a virgin why couldn't he have women you know it's it's it, it's it's a it's a very common phenomena and the fact that uh nationalists uh, have found this um, a fertile place to recruit from is really pretty scary um and so you saw a lot of these i saw a lot of these things kind of connecting and um I wanted to write something about it. <laughs> and, and you did, and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I think was so integral to the portrayal of this story, being that so much of it takes place online, was how you brought tweets to the page. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you could have told this story without that. And one of the things that I found so important about that was how in 120 or whatever characters or less these people were propagating horrible horrible things and making wow. these terrible threats in such a short little amount of words and you know the power of words comes wow. up so much so many times throughout your story and the power of words, both positively and negatively. I mean, you have Sarah Price, one of your protagonists, who is kind of on the opposite side of this, where she is trying to put out the good message of the candidate that she's representing. And, um, you know, as somebody who's had Twitter in my phone for the last however many years, um, that really connected with me to just see how powerful social media can be. I mean, we saw the social media revolutions in Egypt and in Tunisia, and here we have a San Diego politician, a San Diego local newscaster, and a campaigner being so affected by social media, and that's just three people mm -hmm. out of, you know, however many could be targeted or terrorized by social media. And so, you know, as you were writing this, at what point did you sort of realize how important it would be to include that, to just kind of put it in people's faces? It, this is all it takes to make these waves. Um, so I was writing it end of 2015 through 2016. And I'm trying to remember, I, I think I first bring in the social, well, she's working in social media. Oh, well, at the time I had this job. <laughs> I had a job for a while doing social media for a major tech publication. And that was my first, I mean, you know, experience of really working with it. I mean, I did a little bit as an author and I was saying you know, on Facebook and on Twitter and whatever, but, but I was actually doing this like full time writing tweets, you know, and, and, um, and I got really immersed in it and, and, and realized that Sarah, the protagonist, it's like, 
want her to be their social media person, you know, because that's going to be a huge component of, of any campaign going forward. And of course, we, we've seen how big a deal that is. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the second chapter where I actually started bringing in the neighborhood boards and the tweets and all of that, because it's like, this was how people, this is how people get news a lot of the time. And whether it's actually what's happening or fake news or, you know, a distortion of what's really going on, you know, you're sitting at your computer and, and, you know, all of a sudden you're getting these alerts about something that's happening. So I wanted it to unfold that way um, because that would be kind of the way that she would most likely experience it unless I wanted to put her right in the middle of the shooting, which I didn't didn't want to do. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, if you have a story where a major component is social media, you, you, you kind of have to show it. I don't, I don't really think very logically about a lot of these things. It just was like, well, I, let's do a tweet, you know, and, and then the neighbor, the next, I don't know, do you know next door, the neighborhood? Board? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was like, okay, here's my chance to parody next door. I, I had more of next door originally, but, but uh, really? that got trimmed. <laughs> I think a lot of the scenes would have transpired over next door. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. Especially the scenes without no spoilers um, at the Claremont Rec Center. Oh, I think yeah. that would have been all over next all door. All <laughs> over next door. All over next door. And it's, it's interesting too, because um, Casey, the other protagonist is so dependent on the social media and how so much of her job is like, okay, this is happening now, that's where we're going, and we're going to be in this story, and we're going in deep. And um, that was something that I was both impressed by it and also horrified by <laughs> for Casey. There were so many times where I was like, no, not again, <laughs> stop doing this to yourself. But also understanding where she's coming from, because like you said, that so much of this book is wrapped around misogyny. And there's so many times where she has people tell her you shouldn't. And there are times where I was like, no, you really shouldn't, or at least kind of think about this one. <laughs> and, um, you know, just her drive and her motivation to get that story and prove, no, I can do this. And yeah. it will be okay, even though it almost wasn't a few times. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I really appreciated her drive and determination to just prove everybody wrong. Be like, no, I've got this. Right. And um, I thought it was such an interesting character to have juxtaposed to Sarah, who in many ways was actually the same in her determination to sort of overcome things, even though she had such a different um, personality. Your body was... language there is perfect because that's <laughs> Sarah. You know, Sarah wants to be behind the scenes. The last thing she wants to be is exposed. She doesn't want to show herself to anyone. And Casey's work, of course, she's the exact opposite where it's yeah. all about her and, you know, the persona and the face that she presents. Uh, I just felt, I just felt so sorry for Sarah the entire time. I was like, I just want to hug her. Like, <laughs> just like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> we'll get through this. Um, so I, I really, really appreciated that. And um, in the review that I did, I talked about how one of the things that was so special about this story was that even though it's so deep in San Diego, I mean, from our beer culture, which we are point of fact beer people here in San Diego. It has yes. taken over our culture and it is just what you do. If you're going to meet people, you're meeting them at the brewery of yep. choice because there's a lot of them. <laughs> and so, you have many choices, yes. So many. It's, it's almost too many at some point, <laughs> which ballast point. But um, so, you know, one of the things that I really appreciated was how, even though there was so much San Diego culture in this, which was awesome, this story could have taken place anywhere. Except Comic-Con. Except Comic-Con, indeed. <laughs> yeah. But there were other places it could have taken place, it's true. It's just so fascinating that I was reading this during Comic-Con weekend. I didn't really yeah. <laughs> Well, it will happen again. <laughs> Bye. Um, I, I, think, I think San Diego, you know, people don't really, it's a little bit of a hard city to get to know because, you know, people come here because it's pretty and we have beaches and, and the, the weather, nice and yeah. the zoo and, you know, and, and it can seem, and Claremont is a really good example of how it can just seem like it's the burbiest of burbs that ever burbed, but <laughs> it's not really like that. You know, there's a lot going on underneath. And I was thinking about this with Comic-Con. There was a great article 
that Daniel Hernandez wrote for the LA Times just the other day on Comic-Con. He's from San Diego. And just what an important part of our civic culture that it is. And I was thinking about it and I'm like, yeah, because there's this whole, you know, sort of under, not even underground, but there's a current of, you know, in this sort of burby, beautiful city where tourists come to have fun, this, this weird counterculture, pop culture, do it yourself, you know, weird kind of fun spirit that, that really animates the city. And you see it with Comic-Con because the fun part of Comic-Con to me isn't the hall. It's, it's everything surrounding it. The people then, you know, and the cosplayers and all of the work that went into it and, and the joy and, you know, it's, it's, it, it, this is an interesting city. And, you know, I really wanted to write something that took place in my hometown that I hope got a little bit of what it's like across people that don't know it well. So Lisa, I understand that Black Swan Rising is going through a rebrand and it's getting a new cover and is actually in the process of changing publishers. And I've heard quite a few stories from different authors about, you know, absolute horror stories of not ascertaining within their initial contracts with publishers the importance of keeping their rights if the publication company shuts down or if anything should happen. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, being that I, I believe you're in this process right now, would you have any advice to authors or would you like to tell them a bit more about what's happening so that they may have a better understanding of this process? It's, uh, you get a good agent. Uh, you know, I have a good one um, with, a, with a good agency. It's a rather large one that's been around for a while. Um, and most publishing contracts will um, have a provision for rights reversals uh, if the book is out of print or if it falls below a certain print threshold. And, you know, that's the way to do it because, because if it stops selling and, and the publisher is not interested in promoting it, uh, having it sell, then you should be able to get the rights back, basically. What happened in this case was... Um, I published with uh, a company called Midnight Inc., which was a rather large publisher of crime fiction. Um, they're an imprint of another publisher, Llewellyn, which you would know for tarot cards and books on magic with the K. Um, and uh, <laughs> for some reason, and I don't think anybody really understands why, Llewellyn decided to shutter Midnight Inc. And it's, mm. it, it, speaking of mysteries, it was a mystery because they had a ton of books, a lot of authors, you know, um, a, a fair amount of success. It didn't seem to be for any financial reason. I don't know whether the cards came up, you know, sell this or <laughs> Magic 8-Ball said sell the, you know, shutter this. I, I don't know. So basically it orphaned a lot of, of authors um, and uh, they were going to maintain the catalog, but not publish any new books. And so my feeling about it was, it was the only book I had with Midnight Inc., all my other books with a publisher called Soho, um, which is a very good publisher, very solid. And, you know, they keep your books, they, 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 they will continue to promote your books cyclically um, for as long as the company goes on. So I felt good with having my first five books at this publisher, but I did not want this book to be at, at, at orphaned, you know, um, in, a, in a company that didn't really exist anymore. So mm -hmm. we started pretty early on saying, hey, I want the rights back. Hey, I want the rights back. Hey, I want the rights back. And um, Llewellyn, to their credit, was really pretty good about this. I think most of the people that wanted the rights got their rights back and, and they, they reverted a bunch of titles to authors who didn't even need to ask. Um, so when that happens, your odds of actually being able to republish it with another publisher are not large um, because it's already got a publication history. Unless it was a really huge hit, um, you know, another publisher is not going to want to take a bite out of the same apple, basically. So what I decided to do um, was my, my um, literary agency, Curtis Brown, has a co-publishing program, you know. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a hybrid self-publishing kind of a deal and um, for projects by their, their authors that, you know, don't necessarily fit with a traditional publisher or in my situation that don't really have a home to go to. And, you know, I could have done the whole thing myself, but I just, there's a lot to self-publishing. It's not just a simple press and play and I didn't <laughs> want to do that. 
So I, I decided for this one, and also my agent um, is really wonderful. Uh, you know, we've been together for a long time, and and I kind of felt like, you know, if there's any money to be made on this book, and who knows if there is, I, I didn't mind sharing some of it with her and with them because they've worked really hard for me and I haven't necessarily made them a ton of dough. So, um, and the cover was just, I, I'm really happy about that. It was one of it's the- It's gorgeous. Isn't it, isn't it stunning? Yeah. Well, it's the same designer that did the Midnight Ink cover. Um, the, and, and this was one of the concepts and it was always my favorite. I know why they went with the one they went with. It's a little bit more commercial, I think, a little bit more thriller. And, but this one to me really captures the feeling of the story and what it is. Um, so I, it was like, oh, you know, if I'm gonna publish this myself, I wonder if I could get me. So I went to the artist and we went to the publisher and, and we got permission to use this design and I could not be happier with it. So I guess the, the bottom line is being proactive, staying in touch with your agent, staying in touch with your publisher, and just kind of keeping abreast of everything that's happening. Um, you know, so many times I've heard authors just being like, all right, it's out there, it's done. Yeah. And then, you know, getting caught off guard by these sort of things. And um, one of the things I, I try to impress upon as many up and coming authors as possible is, you know, don't, if you want this to be a hobby, sure. Like, yeah. you know, if you're just writing for yourself, you know, that's fine. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong. There's no shame in that. If yeah. you're looking to get this book out there, to make it known, to get your name out there, you know, think of this as a small business yeah. and, and really invest time and your research into the publishing company you're involved with, into the agency that's representing you. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm an indie publisher, but even with indie, you know, it's the same thing. You know, you could just do the push and go, push the button and go, but there's so much more to it. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, treat it like a small business and know the ins and outs so that you can be successful. And so you can take the reins when something like this happens and run with it successfully. And it changes. I mean, you know, indie publishing is, is not for the faint hearted, or at least it shouldn't be. I mean, right. there's, <laughs> it, it, you know, the, I have only kept abreast of it enough to know what I would need to know if I were going to do it. It, it, it's a complicated area and you know how do you market it and all of that so yeah at this point I did just throw up my hands and go now nah, I don't want to do any of that you do it please <laughs> if if you're up for it um during this time of quarantine I mean we've been talking about books and staying active and all this but what have you done to stay focused and creative during this time of quarantine well like Corey um I was a musician in a band for a long time um and then I stopped doing it for a oh, long time. I had a band in LA. And then the last couple of years, I, I took it up again, and I've been playing in a, lo in a local band. And that's been really fun. Then, of course, quarantine comes along and whoops, you can't do that anymore. So um, I decided and, and I was suddenly starting to write songs again, I just have not been able to focus on writing a novel right now. Um, I have an idea for something that I think is going to work better on the other side of what we're going through right now. Um, and until we get through it, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't really feel like I can write it. But I have been, the, the way that my creativity has been wanting to express itself is, is through writing songs. And then here I am, I'm a bass player, you know, and I'm like, you know, I can't really, what can I do with this? I can't go, I can't do live, you know, bass and vocals and nobody, nobody really wants to see that or hear that. But I thought, you know what, I, I should try to learn a little bit about home recording is another one of these things that for years I never bothered to learn because I'd go into a studio and they would do that for me, <laughs> you know, and, and now I'm like, yeah, I should learn how to do this. So uh, I, I, I got some just very basic things and, and started recording with garage band and a robot drummer and was chatting with the guitar player that I, I used to play with up in LA. He was a wonderful musician. And um, he's like, yeah, send them to me. So this has been fantastic because, you know, we had such a good time collaborating. We this band, you know, was like 10 years of a band together and um, we always got along really well creatively. So that has been really, really great. Um, learning how to record, having a couple of songs that, you know, even with the Ro Rosie, the robot drummer are still, you know, they, they express things the way I want them to. They're on the website, I think. And so that's been one thing, um, constant physical, act, you know, making sure that I go outside every day and, and get air and walk and hike and, and do 
that um, has been really key. And then the final thing is I find, you know, I'm like, I really got to get serious about learning some cooking because I just, you know, I love food and um, I'm not going to restaurants. <laughs> so, so that, that's been the other thing, just sort of, you know, trying different recipes and, you know, outfitting my kitchen and, you know, I'm sort of a harmless little obsession, but like, do I need a deboner? I do, you know, <laughs> I better get one. <laughs> I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> well, you never know, you know. So, yeah. so you know, so yeah, I, I, I've been focusing on, on those have been the three things, um, um, writing songs and getting them recorded and, and working with my pal in LA and um, walking a ton and uh, doing some cooking. And then like everybody else, Zooming with friends and virtual cocktail parties and, and all of that. Um, what else can you do, you know? Yeah. Well, Lisa, you know, again, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. This was absolutely fantastic. Guys, if you haven't picked it up yet, I highly recommend picking up Black Swan Rising and checking out the rest of Lisa's works, the link to which will be in the description box below. And also don't forget to subscribe and to hit that notification bell so you'll be in the know as our author interviews and book reviews release. Again, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. This has really been fun. Ridgemont! <laughs>